and get your introduction. So hello, everybody. Uh, today, Dr. Christine Speckens is going to be talking to us about the SKA. Dr. Speckens is a Canadian Science Director for the SKA, also known as Square Kilometer Array. Uh, she's additionally, she's a professor at the Royal Military College of Canada and Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, Dr. Speckens completed an undergraduate degree at Queen's University and proceeded to obtain a PhD from Cornell University in the United States. Her research now focuses on understanding the structure and evolution of nearby galaxies, mainly in a cosmological context. Um, also, she, she's very active in CASCA. Uh, she is the chair of the Equity and Inclusivity Committee of CASCA um, and is playing a very crucial role um, in CASCA's EIC goals. So with that, I'm going to stop. Um, Dr. Speck, well, I'll stop in a moment. Dr. Speck is going to give a presentation of 20 to 30 minutes followed by Q&A, which I'll be fielding. So please feel free to ask your questions in the chat uh, during or after the presentation, um, and we'll address them after. And with that, I'm done. Wonderful, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see so many people online. Um, I'll start by acknowledging that the institutions at which I work are on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee tribes, and I am privileged to live and work on those lands. Um, as Carter mentioned, I'm coming to you today in my capacity as the Canadian SKA Science Director, um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about the SKA, um, and uh, I hope to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, I recognize some of the names on the participant list, uh, so nice to see those of you who I do recognize, nice to meet those of you whose names I don't recognize. Um, just to give me a bit of a sense of who's online, maybe we can we can do a bit of a poll first. Um, so for people who are either undergraduates or graduate students, could you raise your hands? Awesome, lots of thumbs up, lots of hands up. That's great. Um, okay, and folks, who have used radio data before or who are interested in using radio data, could you raise your hands? So these are any kind of data from radio telescopes and you can define that however you would like. Okay, good number of hands and lots of hands that are, are not raised. Perfect. Um, so uh, I will give you uh, an overview today of the SKA and it'll be geared um, towards giving you a sense of how, what the science that the telescope will do will be, um, what the telescope is uh, and why you should be interested independent of whether you're um, someone who considers themselves to be using radio data or someone who hasn't thought about using radio data just yet. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen here. I will first identify the location of my presentation. Okay, hang on. And then let's do a view full screen mode. Okay, uh, hang on. Can you see that? Let me try again. Okay. I'm gonna try and share one more time. Okay, can you see that? Yes, we can. Wonderful, okay, let's try this. You'd think after 18 months, I'd get the hang of this. Um, view, full screen mode. Oh, shoot. Can you, you can't see it, can you? Bring... No, no, unfortunately. <sighs> okay. For what Let it's me... worth, I don't think anybody's gonna figure it out after any amount of time. <laughs> Let me go, um, if you don't mind, I'll go in this mode. Is that okay? Is it still clear? Yep, that's absolutely perfect. Okay, let me just make this window a little bit bigger. Boggles the mind, there we go. Oh shoot, hang on, yep, nope. You can also hide okay. the natural bar if you want. Oh, you know what? Let's just, let's just do that. It good to me, if you Is that okay? Want. All right, yeah. awesome. Um, all right, uh, so I will, like I said, I'll give you an update on the SKA and particularly Canada and the SKA. Um, this is a project that's moving really fast right now. The, the project is evolving quite quickly and I'll, I'll explain that. 
Um, the best information for uh, Canada related to Canada's involvement in the SKA is on the SKA telescope website. So that's the first link that I've shown there. Um, the project is moving so fast that we tend to lag behind the international site, which is the second um, web link that I've given there. So that's the best place to go for the most up to date information. Um, we do maintain a, a mailing list that doesn't see very much traffic, but we do post um, some of the more significant developments in the project to um, a mailing list. So if you'd like to join that conversation, um, I've given you the instructions. So you can send an email to all plus subscribe at skcanada.groups.io. Um, so very briefly, um, I'll, I'll give you a, an overview of the, the, the telescope itself. Um, so the telescope that I'm about to describe is technically called SKA phase one um, or SKA one. Almost always when people talk about the SKA in conversation, it's this first phase of the telescope that they that they refer to. So I'm going to use the terms SKA and SKA one interchangeably. And what that refers to is a facility that is built over three sites, Australia, South Africa, and the UK. It's two telescopes, one observatory, and the headquarters is in the UK. Um, the technical description of that facility is called the design baseline, and it costs about 1.7 billion euros in construction and operations funding in the first decade, so from 2021 to 2030. And it's the result of a decade long design phase that cost about 250 million euros. It, it was part, about 600, 600 scientists and engineers participated in that phase, including Canadian scientists and engineers. And that phase is now complete. And the construction is gonna take place from 2021 to 2028. In fact, construction is expected to start in a matter of weeks. So the, the baseline design, as I mentioned, has is two telescopes. SKA-1 Low will be built in Western Australia. So it will operate from 50 to 350 megahertz. And it will consist of a bunch of dipoles, um, which are effective telescopes at those low radio frequencies. And so those dipoles are arranged into a set of stations. And that's the picture that you see on the left-hand side. The SKA-1 dipoles aren't expected to look quite like this. I haven't yet updated this picture, but you get the idea of these antenna sort of Christmas. Sometimes they're colloquially called Christmas trees because that's what they look like. Um, um, and they'll be situated in Western Australia. And then SK-1 mid will operate from 350 megahertz to over 15 gigahertz. So the, the telescopes, or the, the dishes themselves are spec to about 20 gigahertz. And there'll be around 200 of them of which 65 make up the Meerkat array and Meerkat has just been commissioned. It's, it's actually doing science. Okay. Um, and the picture that you see on the right is a picture of a, an SKA dish that is um, uh, that, that looks very much, it's, it's similar to, but not identical to the meerkat dishes that are on the ground now. Um, and there is an SKA demonstrator telescope on the ground as well. So there's a, a couple of different ways that you can think about the SKA in terms of comparing to facilities that we have available today. And some of those key numbers are in the bottom right hand sides of each of these plots. So in terms of sensitivity, it's a couple of times more sensitive. In terms of resolution, it's a couple of times, it's got a couple of times higher resolution. But the key metric for the SKA is survey speed. So the SKA will be a much faster survey instrument than what we have available today, sort of of order 50 to 100 times. And the relevant or a relevant benchmark would be LOFAR for the SKA-1 low and the JVLA or the very large array for SKA-1 mid. Um, so this slide is meant for people who, who are use radio facilities. So I won't spend a huge amount of time on it. It's a pretty technical slide. Um, but for people who have thought about or used radio facilities before, this puts the SKA in context with facilities that you may have used before. So the JVLA and LOFAR, um, as well as the NGBLA and ALMA. And so in both of these panels, frequency is on the x-axis. On the left-hand panel is sensitivity measured as effective area divided by system temperature. And on the right-hand side is survey speed. So that quantity squared times the field of view. So in other words, sensitivity is, is how deep you can go when you stare at a spot. And survey speed is the combination of how deep you can go in one pointing times how big your pointing is, right? How fast can you cover the sky? And so you can see that um, the, the, the facility that I'm talking about is the blue lines, SK1 low and SK1 mid. So you can see that it is um, considerably more sensitive than LOFAR and the, GVLA, and the JVLA. In the frequency range where they overlap, 
SKA1 and NGBLA will have similar sensitivities. I could talk a little bit more about that, but you can see that the frequency ranges of those two facilities is different. And the SK is operating at lower frequencies than ALMA. So if that's a facility you've used before, we're moving to, to lower radio frequencies. So the, the facility will tackle a number. So this is a general purpose facility. It's expected to be operational for several decades. And I can, I can hear some feedback. So I'll just stop. I think did it. It's all okay. Good. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so uh, the within that that um, mandate to be a general facility, um, there are a number of high priority science objectives that have been identified, and that's what's highlighted here. Um, so there are, I guess, seven on this list, and they range from strong field tests of gravity, cosmology and dark energy, the origin of and evolution of cosmic magnetism, cosmic dawn, the transient radio sky, galaxy evolution through radio continuum and neutral hydrogen, and then the, the, the cradle of life. Um, I'm not going to go through and describe all of those uh, all of those science cases, um, but what I will say is that for a telescope at these radio frequencies, a lot of the processes that we're probing are non-thermal. So if you uh, have heard of radio continuum emission before, so for example, if you have um, uh, charged particles that are excited by a magnetic field, um, those particles are emit synchrotron radiation. That's an example of non-thermal emission in the sense that it's not necessarily or it's indirectly tied to the temperature of that gas or of those particles. And so a lot of the science cases here um, focus on non-thermal radio emission. As you move higher up in frequency, so to NGVLA and then to ALMA frequencies, a lot of those processes are thermal. So you can tackle the same broad science cases, but often with a different tracer and using a different physical mechanism. So um, I've, I've colored all of these bullets red to remind myself to tell you um, that uh, can Canadians are part of the science working groups that are developing these science cases for all of these different topics. And if one surveys the expertise in the Canadian scientific community with respect to these priorities, um, what emerges is that Canada is a world leader in pulsars, cosmic magnetism, transients, and low frequency cosmology. Um, and those are really fields that where the primary wavelength at which that science is done is wavelengths that overlap with the SKA. And Canadians also have multi-wavelength expertise in galaxy evolution, multi-messenger astronomy, and planetary system formation. And those are science, um, science fields where radio is one part of the picture, and then there's a, a other multi-wavelength data are, are very important in filling out other areas of that, other pieces of that puzzle. Um, so these, this is our expertise now, um, but given that the SKA is a facility for a generation, um, this of course will evolve as, uh, as expertise and interest and um, the Canadian community grows as well. So here's a, a timeline for the SKA, and I've this I, I've uh, so I made this timeline, um, and I made the timeline to focus on science. Um, so the construction start for the SKA is expected to be this year. That red arrow on the far left is actually a little too far left by about two or three months. Um, so construction will start in July. Science commissioning with the facility will start in the middle of 2023. Science verification is expected for 2026. And science verification is the um, coincides with having facilities on the ground that are equal to or slightly more powerful than what's available now. So scientifically competitive facilities will be available in the middle of 2026, and that will allow for science verification to take place. Full observations are expected to start in early 2028 with PI programs and then key science projects, which is SKA speak for large programs, will be in full swing by the end of the decade. Now, I mentioned that the SKA is fundamentally a survey instrument. So even from very early days, it's expected that most of the time on SK1 will be spent doing surveys. And that's what the pie chart on the right hand side illustrates. Those, those numbers are pretty, those are some pretty wide ranges that, that remains to be finalized by the project. But somewhere between 50 and 75% of all the time will be spent doing large projects. Something like 25 to 45% of the time will be PI time. So the, there's been a lot of developments in the project in the last year or so, but one of the more notable ones is that the construction proposal, as well as the operations proposal, technically we call that the observatory establishment and delivery plans mouthful, um, but it basically pertains to everything that doesn't involve building the thing. 
Um, so those proposals have been developed and they've been approved by the project and they've been publicly released. So I've given you the, the web link for where you can find uh, that information. Um, so the pre-construction phase, so all of the design that's happened um, that will be required to build this these facility has been completed. And the start of construction, which in these documents is called T0, is expected on the 1st of July, 2021. So in a couple of weeks time. So I'll, I'll get to the recommendation for the SKA in the long range plan soon, um, but you may have noticed that there's a participation level inside that plan. And so because this is an audience of, of potential future observers, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on the kinds of observing opportunities that might be available for the SKA um, for, for Canadian, uh, Canadian astronomers. So I mentioned that a lot of the time or most of the time is expected to be spent on these key science projects. So large programs that take something like a thousand hours or 5,000 hours or 10,000 hours of telescope time to carry out over several years. And so one of the things that I did a couple of years ago was took that model um, for key science projects. And given how much time is expected to be available on the two facilities, you can actually estimate how many of those projects will be carried out in a decade. And then if you assume a leadership structure that is similar to some of the other large projects on radio telescopes that are being carried out now, you can estimate how many roles or how many um, spaces, if you will, might be available inside those within those projects in order for people to contribute. And so that's what you're seeing on this pie chart. So for a participation that's proportional to Canada's expected participation level, sorry, for a, a telescope uh, time that is proportional to Canada's expected participation level of 6%, that's what's shown on the left here. And then you can come up with various scenarios where Canada emphasizes, say, leadership over participation or participation over leadership. And that's what those other two um, sets of um, uh, histograms are. Um, but the, the point here, what I wanted to illustrate to you is the, the kinds of numbers that we're talking about, right? So in the next decade, there will be an opportunity for of order 100, over 100, several hundred people, Canadian astronomers to get involved in these large programs. And there will be spaces for you know, tens of people to play really important roles and for somewhere between five and 10 people to lead 10,000 hour programs on this, you know, the, the, this marquee facility. And of course, as the graduate students now and the undergraduates now, this, these, are, these will be your roles. Okay? And so there's lots of opportunities or there will be lots of opportunities for participation at, at a really meaningful level in the SKA. So the SKA is a telescope and we're building it to do science. And that's what I've talked about so far. Um, but the SKA vision and mission as a project is broader than that. And so um, what I'm showing you here are two versions, the 200 character version of the SKA vision and the slightly longer version of the SKA vision on the right hand side. Those are both publicly available statements. They're just because of the transition right now, they're rather hard to find. But the, the point here is that the mission of the SKA is to build telescopes and do science and do it in a way that's sustainable and that benefits the world. Okay, um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. So the, the broader impacts of the SKA are detailed in the construction proposal and they're structured around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So those are 17 goals that the um, uh, symbols or the logos are represented here. And the purple boxes represent um, the goals that are specifically addressed in the SKA construction proposal. Um, and so the idea is that the, the uh, now I'm showing you the mission statement on the bottom left hand corner after I showed you the vision statement on the previous slide. But the mission is to build telescopes, do cutting edge science, and to do so in a way that positively impacts society. Um, so in particular, um, there, uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the broader impacts as they pertain to partnerships with local populations. Um, and so uh, these are two pictures that I uh, copied and pasted from the construction proposal, which is publicly available. And that's what I've given you the, the link on the bottom left hand here, how left hand side. So the picture on the right shows a group from a walkover of the SKA Australia site. 
So that's a combination of scientists from the Australian National Academy called CSIRO, um, from uh, members of the native title holders of that land, the Wajari people, as well as archaeologists and historians. And so what they did was they walked through all of the, the locations on the future SKA site where low stations would be located to record and protect um, artifacts and um, cultural locations of cultural significance to the Wajari people. So the Wajari in Australia are the native title holders. That's the uh, Australian terminology of that land. Now in South Africa, the peoples that walked, some of the, the, the first recorded peoples that walked the land on the site where the SKA will be located are the sand people. They're some of the oldest, they're among the oldest civilizations known to have walked the earth. Um, and uh, so what you're seeing in the picture on the right is a sand leadership blessing of the future SKA site in South Africa. Um, and since 2017, it's been an, a memorandum of understanding or a, an MOU in place um, that al uh, allows for use and development of the site in exchange for or um, in, collab in collaboration with the sand people while also protecting um, sites of heritage and cultural importance, as well as providing benefits to local sand people, in particular sand youth. So the same walkovers that I described on the Australian site have also taken place on the South African site. Now, it's important to keep in mind that South Africa and Australia have very different recent histories, and therefore um, their, uh, the needs and um, uh, the, the, the needs and demographics of their local populations are very different. And in particular on the African continent, it's important to keep in mind that there are lots of local peoples who are economically, severely economically disadvantaged relative to other populations. And so the SKA in South Africa has played a big role in um, bringing local farmers, so farmers that are local to the Karoo site where the SKA is located, um, partnering with them and um, taking actions to improve their economic status, and also partnering with institutions across the African continent to bring opportunities such as, uh, for example, training in big, big data um, to, um, to, to institutions and nations across the continent. And I can talk a little bit more about that if people, if people are interested. Um, but the, the idea here is that these are the, the starts of partnerships with local and indigenous populations that are required in this view of building telescopes sustainably. So there, there is work that has been done. There's obviously, you know, that partnership is to grow. Um, and, um, but the, there are relationships that are established so that that consent for using the land and for also benefiting the traditional owners of that land can be established and grown. So I, I've told you about the science, and this is a slide to remind myself that I've told you about the science. And the reason I wanted to remind myself to tell you that, uh, that I've told you about the science is that um, the data rates from the SKA are so large that to actually do that science, we're going to need um, supercomputing facilities. And so that the cartoon on the left, the right hand side, sorry, illustrates this concept of SKA regional data centers. Um, so the SKA drops the data part and calls these things SRCs for regional centers. Um, and so that the kind of volume of calibrated data, so this isn't what's coming down from the telescope, this is what's required, what you have to handle in order to do your science. So globally, that data rate is going to be about 700 petabytes a year. Um, processing of order 22 petaflops is going to be needed. And a network speed of around 100 gig, gig, gigabytes per second is going to be needed to shovel that data all around the world. And so the idea is that a network of data centers called these SRCs are going to be needed um, in order for sciences, scientists to exploit their data. So these data centers are envisioned as a partnership between the SKA and participating countries to provide users access to the SKA data, host the science archive, and provide computing support, as well as create, create and maintain analysis tools. And so there's a diagram on the left hand side that shows the growth in functionality. So that's basically people who know how to run a data center and then the growth in capacity. So that's basically the, the growth of storage and compute that is needed to host all of that data um, through the decade. So basically it starts now and then it ramps up to full capacity through the decade. And so Canada is going to need access to one of these things. And the recommendation is that Canada hosts its own data center. And the reason for that is it would leverage our scientific computing platform and archive development strengths. And it would also provide the only such facility in the Americas. So these data centers are 
important tools for um, scientific productivity in the sense that if you observe with the SKA, you will need access to one of these data centers in order to carry out what you know the science you said you were going to do in the proposal. Okay? Um, but it's also important to recognize that data centers and archives are important vehicles for scientific accessibility as well. So getting that scientific data out to more than the people who just proposed for the time. And so this is really nicely explored for the NASA facilities. And that's the picture that I'm showing on the left hand side. So this is a paper by Peek et al that's available on the archive. So the, the um, Y axis of that plot shows the number of unique first author institutes on any type of publication, right? So if you have a whole bunch of people from the University of Toronto on a single publication, the number on the Y axis is one, right? And if you have a whole bunch of people from 20 different institutions, then the number on the Y axis is 20. And you take all of the, the first author institutions, um, Oh, sorry, first author. Uh, so uh, you take all of, let me rephrase. If you have 20 papers that are all from the same institution, the number on the y-axis is one. And if you have 20 papers who all have different first authors, then the number on the y-axis is 20. Sorry about that. And on the x-axis, on the left-hand side, are publications by observers. So these are the publications that come out from observers that control the telescopes through the observation process. And on the right hand side are archival publications. So these are people who go to the NASA archive, pull down the data, do some science with that data and then publish. Okay. And the point here is that the left hand, the right hand points are about a factor of two higher than the right hand points. So there are roughly twice the number of first author publications from different institutions that come out of the archive then come out of the observation process. And not only that, but if you look at the demographics of those first authors, the institutions where the first authors are using the archive to do their science tend to be more diverse than the institutions from where the first authors tend to be the ones who did the observations. And that holds both nationally and internationally. So that's true if you look at just the institutions that are based in the US, and it's also true if you look at the institutions globally. So the point here is that robust data archives foster EDI in the sense that they allow a broader diversity of authors to access the data. And so the vision for a Canadian SRC is to be a hub of Canadian activity for the SKA to foster both scientific productivity, so to let proposers access their data, but possibly more importantly, also scientific accessibility is to allow everybody to access the data and a broader diversity that tends to emerge from the proposal process. So I'm not going to talk very much about Canadian technology right now, but um, if you have questions, I'm happy to field them. Um, so uh, Canada has been involved in technology development for the SKA um, since uh, for the past uh, decade or two. And the key Canadian technology that has been developed and specced into SKA phase one is the central signal processor. So if, um, which colloquially you can think of as the correlator. So the correlator is the thing that multiplies on SK1 mid. So that's the South African facility. Um, and it's uh, the thing that multiplies the signals from all the individual dishes together to make an image very, very uh, roughly. Um, and so uh, Ken has been conditionally allocated that package during construction. And the idea is that that provides a, mean, a means for Canada to contribute to the project while providing a return to Canadian industry in the form of jobs. And so this is a, a suite of in-kind or the biggest portion of a suite of in-kind contributions that Canada would make in exchange for its contribution to the project. The idea being that we wanna maximize the, the amount of funding that is spent on a project like this um, to being spent in Canada. Um, so Canada, as I said, has a long history of um, working with correlators. We are among the world leaders in building correlators. We've built correlators for a lot of the, the telescopes that, that are operational today. Um, and Canada led this consortium during the design phase. And the hope is that we will um, be able to, to lead this package during the construction phase as well. Um, and then there's a bit about conditional allocations and actual allocations that you can, you can ask me about if you're curious. So everything I've, I've told you about so far um, was uh, described uh, to uh, in the context of the long range planning process um, of which you've likely heard. 
um, and uh, made the went, were submitted to the long range panel in the form of recommendations. And that uh, the SKA has been prioritized by that process. Um, the dominant recommendation related to the SKA is number 17 um, in the LRP 2020. So I've copied the text of that recommendation here. Um, all of it, it's very wordy recommendations. So I've tried to box the bits that are um, sort of uh, give the most information in terms of the recommendation itself. Um, so the top box is uh, that Canada participate in the construction and operation of SKA phase one, as well as in its regional centers, as well as in governance. Um, the middle bit talks a little bit about the participation level that's recommended. So it's that 6% that I talked about before. And then the bottom box, um, uh, stipulates uh, that like with all other Canadian facilities that Canadian participation in SK1 should be uh, subject to a site of a set of guiding principles centered on the consent uh, for the SKA sites from Indigenous peoples and traditional title holders. Okay. Um, so the, the cost of Canada's participation in the SKA in a way that fulfills that recommendation is given on the left-hand side of this uh, slide. Um, so from 2021 to 2030, the cost is about 290 million 2021 inflation adjusted Canadian dollars. Um, there's a whole science around the units of these kinds of numbers. This is actually consistent with the numbers that are in the LRP, but the units are a little bit different. We can talk about that if you're interested. And about half of those funds would stay in Canada. And given that construction is gonna start very soon on the SKA, um, there's been significant engagement by the Coalition for Canadian Astronomy. So this is a, a partnership between the Canadian Astronomical Society, between the um, Association for Canadian uh, University, the Association of Canadian Universities for Research and Astronomy, Acura, as well as industry, to ensure that the government is aware of the importance, costs, benefits, and timeline for a decision to be made on this project. So this touches on an area of um, uh, Canadian, the Canadian funding model that you may have heard if you were tuned into the CASCA meeting last week in particular, um, for these big science projects. So this kind of money is the kind of money that was needed from JWST. It's the kind of money that has been allocated to the TMT. Um, it's the kind of money that these large science projects require in order to, to secure Canadian participation. There's no funding mechanism or competition in Canada that allows that kind of big science to be done. So the, the only way to secure commitments like that is to lobby government directly. And you may have seen in the LRP that that's pointed out, you know, it, it's been pointed out before, but that's a, a problem with the way uh, science is funded in Canada. And so we have no choice but to make sure that the government is aware of this, um, of, of the project um, by, uh, by uh, raising that awareness ourselves. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm getting up to half an hour here, so I'm going to stop soon, I promise. Uh, I just wanted to point out that the leadership, uh, it, people in leadership roles in Canada, I'm not going to spend a really long time on this slide, but just to say that there are people who are working on the international stage, and that's sort of the top half of the slide, and then there are people who are playing leadership roles within Canada to make sure that the Canadian community is informed about what's happening with the SKA and the state of Canada's participation in the SKA. Um, and then there are also people representing Canada on the international stage. Um, but where I will end is here, okay? So how can you get involved um, for all the graduate students and undergraduates who are on the line, but really anybody? Um, so there are a couple of things and they sort of go from decreasing to increasing order of commitment, right? Um, so the first thing you can do is join the SKA Canada, uh, and when I'm better rested, I spell that, that right, um, mailing list, okay? So fire an email to that mailing list and you know, you'll get updates maybe two, three times a year about things that are happening on the project. Um, another option is to attend a science conference. So there was actually a science conference that just took place in mid-March. It had 950 participants from all around the world. It was a fully virtual format. And um, certainly uh, when the world goes back to traveling again, that, that's one option is to go to one of these conferences. Um, but one of the options or one of the, the advantages of virtual conferences is that it's a little bit easier to engage and it's also a little bit cheaper. And so there's gonna be lots of opportunities moving forward to easily access science conferences like the SKA Science Conference. So keep your eye out for opportunities. There'll be opportunities to travel, but there will also be opportunities to connect, connect remotely. And there are all sorts of good reasons for doing that as well. 
Um, if you'd like to get a little more engaged, one option would be to, to join an SKA science working group. So all those high priority science objectives that I described have working groups behind them that are developing the science case. If that's something in which you're interested, you can uh, send an email to contact at skatelescope.ca. That, that goes to me um, and I can point you in the right direction. In the next two or three months, there's a the, the transition in the project is so big, moving from pre-construction to construction, that it might take a couple of months for those working groups to spin up again. They're on a bit of a, you know, a few month hiatus right now. But if you're interested, I'll make sure to put you in touch and to, um, to give you the information to, to join a working group. Um, you could use Serata data products. So Serata stands for the Canadian Initiative uh, for Radio Astronomy Data Analysis. I think I've got that right. Um, and so this is a, uh, a collaboration within Canada that is building science ready, ready data products for, for anybody to use, as well as software for people to, to produce their own data products. So if you go to serata.ca, there's lots of data that are, that's available already, particularly the VLAS survey on the VLA. And the idea behind those products is that you should be able to take them and use them for science. We've tried to take the telescope out of those data and take the work of using those large data sets out of the, as much as, as possible to make them as ready for, to use for science as possible. And then finally, you can work with Pathfinder data. So there are dozens of Pathfinders for the SKA that are uh, online now. Um, ha they have regular calls for proposals. And so that's what the picture on the right illustrates. So this is a picture from the Meerkat telescope of the Galactic Center. Um, and there is a spectacular level of detail. We've been looking at the Galactic Center since, since radio telescopes have existed, right? And yet every time we look at it with a bigger and more powerful instrument, we see something new. And so there's a huge amount of detail in this particular picture, among other things, and this is associated with a press release, there are radio bubbles near the Galactic Center that we hadn't seen before this image was generated. So there's lots of opportunities to, to um, get your hands on some data through regular proposal calls. And those are uh, evaluated on scientific merit. Um, so my take home message for you is that the SK will be a generational telescope for Canadian astronomers and, and, and that's you. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm happy to take questions now for any questions you have about the SKA project. Um, but I'd also like to hear how you would like to use the, the, the telescope and how we can get ready to allow you to, um, to get as much out of this facility as possible. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christine. I, I'm happy to speak for everybody here saying that was incredibly interesting and I'm sure more questions will come in, but we already have a couple. Um, so the first one by Jess Speedy, this was earlier in the presentation. She asked, what does open time mean? Yep. Um, and I believe that referred to the pie chart you had. Um, yeah. Describing large programs and PI time. I'm gonna start, I will start to scroll through this thing. We'll see how um, okay. successful I am. I apologize, I'm not uh, super, there it is. Yeah, one more. Okay, um, yeah, so open time is time that is available to be proposed for by um, all anyone in the world who is not necessarily an SKA partner. So the SKA has adopted the open science model whereby after a proprietary period, the data will be released publicly. Um, and that proprietary period is usually on the order of 12 to 18 months. And that's basically how just about all telescopes work at just about all wavelengths right now. Um, and so when you propose and are successful for time, uh, successful in securing time, so only uh, astronomers and in partner countries will be able to go through the proposal process. Um, and so when you're successful, your data are proprietary for a certain amount of time. Um, and so PI time is the, the fraction of time available to proposers from a partner country in the SKA and open time is the fraction of time available to um, anyone who is not necessarily in uh, at an institution that is in a partner country. Great, thank you. Um, so we have another question. Uh, this is from Blake Ledger. He asks about the peak at all plot. Uh, I believe that's a plot where I'm showing the different types of uh, observation yep. ob observers versus archival publications. Not perfect. Yep. So he asks, uh, do they explore the different populations which contribute to these curves, i.e. are the majority of observer publications established faculty, while the archival publications are students, ECRs, or underrepresented groups? Ooh, um, you know what, let me get back to you on that. I don't remember, I don't remember that. I wanna, no, you know what, I, I don't remember. Um, what I, when I, um, when I mentioned that um, population, the population was more diverse, um, that was, um, if it, looking 
in country um, that was uh, the the size of the college and the location of the college we're talking about the US right um, and then around the world it was GDP that was used to distinguish between um, uh, between sort of haves and, and have nots um, I don't remember whether they look by career stage um, there have been investigations of the NASA facilities and access by career stage but I don't know if it was in this particular study so I'll find out and get back to you yeah, thanks, Christine. I can look up the, the paper on my own time as well, but I appreciate the response. Also, I think I'd asked that before you mentioned about the diverse range at either end. So okay. um, yeah, that answered my question a little bit anyway. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks. And I also mentioned, um, if I'm asking a question on your behalf, please feel free to jump in at any time and expand upon it or respond. Uh, so we have another one from Jess Speedy. She asks, where in Canada would the SRC be located? Yeah, um, that's a great question. We get it a lot. Um, the, the short answer is is everywhere, right? So um, the idea is that it's a virtual hub rather than a physical hub. Um, and so the um, for people who have heard of the new digital research organization, uh, digital research infrastructure organization, or Endrio, which is the successor to Compute Canada, um, it's expected that the hardware and the storage for the um, SK SRCs will be located at Compute Canada and Endrio hubs, which will become Endrio hubs. And so the actual servers will be sitting in you know, the places that already have servers. Um, but the idea is that the, the, the intellectual part of the SRCs will be distributed in universities around the country. And that's a little bit how Serata works right now. So um, it's of order six uh, full-time staff um, that are on the science support side that are distributed a little all around the country um, that cover that that are responsible for doing things like making sure that the software that um, the SRC runs is aligned with Canadian interests as well as the interests of proposers all around the world. It's th those are the people that would take ideas and sort of try to partner or match them with uh, available um, the available resources. And so the idea is that the SRC would be a virtual hub of Canadian activity and it would be distributed across the country. And that is the, S the data center in Canada is also the logical place to do things like run outreach programs. So EPO programs, as well as running target EDI program. So uh, equity, diversity, and inclusivity would also be tied into that center. And again, the idea is to make that a distributed effort. And I, I actually have a follow up on that. If I remember correctly, there was a plot showing the functionality um, of these, these SRCs or related to the SRCs as a function of time. Perfect. So around 2025 is when you're expecting this higher functionality. Um, does that mean that people here, like myself, who will be graduating in, say, 2024, 2025, would have the opportunity to work in the SRC or involved with the SRC, be involved with the SRC? Yeah, so, um, so yes, exactly how that develops in the next couple of years is going to depend a little bit on uh, the mechanism by which Canada commits to construction and, and operations. I didn't talk about that today because it's, you know, frankly, science is better, um, but I, I can elaborate on that if you'd like. So um, if you are interested in, um, in contributing to the development of the SRC concept, there's um, an opportunity to, um, to contribute to some of the working groups that are, that are happening right now. Um, if you're interested in contributing on the, you know, to a Canadian SRC, then there should be opportunities or there are opportunities and there will be opportunities to partner with um, uh, institutions like CADC or um, uh, Canary or um, CANFAR, right? Those are all good examples that they all run programs whereby you could, um, uh, you could partner with them to do some of this development. If you are interested in a job in doing this development, um, uh, you know, if all goes well, CADC will be hiring radio astronomers or people with uh, ex expertise with a, um, in radio astronomy. That's a, that's a shortcoming of CAD, CADC staff right now. So yeah, by 2025, there will be a need for uh, people um, to, uh, to develop the capacity or to, to start to think about developing the know-how so that when the capacity comes online, when you increase the compute power or you increase the storage, that that can be used efficiently. Great, thank you for that. Um, it, yeah, so a lot of exciting opportunities. Uh, we have one more question. This is by Terry Bridges. Um, yes, I would assume CADC would host the Canadian SRC. Well, you kind of already answered that, actually. But I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to say. Um, what? Oh, so uh, I can elaborate in this way. Um, uh, just in terms of sort of what 
what why the SRCs are a little bit different from what CADC offers now. So the niche for the SKA isn't sort of high performance computing per se, um, but it's high throughput computing. So the idea is that you have to do sort of a fairly high performance compute on large volumes of data that's being pushed and pulled all around the world. So in the SKA model, the data isn't sitting isn't necessarily sitting at the same spot as the compute. Um, and so the idea is that the data will be spread around the world in these so-called data lakes, so repositories for where the data lives. And then we're going to need to push and pull that data very quickly in order to, to manipulate it. So this high throughput model is not a capacity that exists within the Canadian digital resource infrastructure ecosystem right now. So the particular development, the innovation that has to happen, um, that functionality curve is driven by the need to incorporate the capacity to do high throughput compute within the Canadian DRI system. And once you've got it for the SKA, then for applications that don't need that high throughput, you can repurpose it for other things, right? So the idea is that this will add to the broader Canadian digital research infrastructure ecosystem. Perfect, thank you. Um, I see Blake, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks again, Christine, for, for this presentation. This was uh, pretty informative. I, I also appreciate that it was different than Casca's uh, last week because I also <laughs> saw that. And, so, and so I appreciate that it was um, ad additional information, especially for at, like our science level. Um, so I was having discussion about this talk with um, someone in my research group. Um, I'm here at McMaster. Um, and they were, they, we were kind of discussing about what happens if you aren't taking necessarily the traditional academia path. So if you finish your PhD and you don't want to continue in science um, and what kind of opportunities are available with the SKA, for example, for those folks who kind of continue more into industry. So to read kind of what they were asking is, are there algorithm, data science, engineering opportunities um, that will come about with the SKA as well for, for grad students who are kind of graduating and not going in that direction? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the SKA is as much a software telescope as it is a telescope, you know, uh, made of metal, right? Um, and so there is a huge need for people with um, astronomy backgrounds branching out into data science and for um, individuals with data expertise in data science that wish to be engaged in astronomy or that wish to sort of branch out or branch back in to astronomy. Um, so to give you an example, the, the Serata collaboration um, employs of order, so across the five year duration of the grant, there will have been about 60 software engineer scientist type people. And what has been found is that a good balance is about half of those people are astronomers with data science skills and about half of those people are data scientists who are reaching in or reaching back into astronomy. So one of the, the things that needs to be developed part of this functionality curve is actually figuring out how to use the best practices within um, the sort of pure data science um, for our own astronomical research. So yes, there is absolutely a role, a desperately needed role um, that will become more and more important both in the SKA, but as in other projects as well. Um, so people who um, don't pursue astronomy research, um, but pursue um, fields that are more related to data science, um, I think uh, we'll, find a, we'll find a home in the SKA. There's be, there'll be lots of opportunities. Thanks, Christine. I also was reflecting as you were chatting as well, even talking about the, the regional data centers, I feel like there's an opportunity there. Um, and you had mentioned something about um, outreach and teaching data science skills in the actual physical locations um, of where the telescopes are being built as well. So I can imagine that would also be an opportunity. In Absolutely. Yeah, so I think that there's a, uh, some scope for Canada to play a leadership role in this idea of research inclusion, right? So not only out, which encompasses outreach, right? So how do you make sure that the, the public at large um, uh, has access to uh, um, the, the data and the, the, the knowledge that's generated by a facility like this, but also that we're as um, inclusive as possible in that outreach, both at the public level, as well as at the, um, you know, at different levels of education. Um, and so uh, one of the first things to do once there is some um, a commitment to the SKA is to really develop that research inclusion plan. Um, and so I think that dovetails really nicely with initiatives related to EDI as well as to outreach and there'll be opportunities there as well. Uh, fantastic, thanks so much. Great, thank you very much, Christine. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat and nobody else has their hands up. Um, so if you have a question, ah, perfect, hands. Uh, Jess 
Speedy has a question if you wanna. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> hi, Christine. Thank you for answering my previous questions. Um, I'm really interested in, in the SKA, um, both for science, but also because I was born in South Africa. And so I feel like I have a, a connection, but um, so you mentioned in your, in your last slide about ways to get involved um, sort of in the intermediate uh, level of involvement was join a working group. And I'm wondering what exactly does that entail? Whoops. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, so um, the science case for the SKA um, is has been developed um, within these different working groups. So what a working group is, is a collection of people that have some expertise and interest in a particular science topic. Um, and do uh, work together to try and exercise exactly um, what capabilities might be required in order to, to do that science with the SKA, um, as well as to understand where the SKA as spec excels in that particular science case. Um, so I, I study galaxies, so I'll give that as, a, as an example, but it sort of works for all the other working groups as well, right? So on the, um, one of the ways to study galaxies is to look at their neutral hydrogen emission. And so I am on the H1 working group for, uh, for the SKA. And that working group actually has people who are experts in H1, but it also has people who are experts in other aspects of galaxy evolution, right? Because ultimately what we wanna do is, is understand how galaxies form and evolve. Um, and so anyone who has an interest in doing that kind of science with the SKA is welcome to join that working group, even if your expertise isn't within the radio. In fact, that perspective is really important because it's sometimes, you know, when you get a bunch of radio astronomers together, sometimes that perspective is lost. Um, so that's what I mean by working group. They are um, generally, uh, they, they are fairly informal depending on, the, depending on the working group. They tend to do their work on timescales of sort of months to years. And they're generally interested in um, using the SKA for science and understanding how that science case develops over the years. And it's a, because these kinds of facilities take so long to build, right? That, you know, the SKA has been designing, you know, the design phase took 20 years, right? It's going to take 10 years to build. And it's going to be a facility that's going to operate for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, you really have to take the long view to try and understand what kind of science is going to be done. And that's the role of these working groups. Okay. So they have like, their membership is large. Uh, yeah, their membership tends to be large. I can't remember off the top of my head what they, how, how large the membership is. Um, uh, the H1 working group, I want to say, has, I'm going to guess about 50, 50 to, 50 to 75 people on it. Um, those people have various uh, activity levels, we'll say that. So, you know, some people are active in particular aspects. Some people like to sort of pay attention to what's happening. Other people devote a lot of time. So it really depends on your interest and your availability um, and the, the, you know, what's being tackled at that particular time. Um, but there's certainly groups in which people could be involved without, you know, there's no expectation that you spend, you know, 10 hours of every week doing, doing SKA related stuff. So they, they, they try to be flexible in that respect to allow people to engage without requiring them to spend a whole bunch of time that they may or may not have. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, where can you find like a list of working groups that have already been established? Um, you can find that on the SKA website. Maybe um, I am going to be incapable of doing this while also talking. Um, but uh, if you go to the SKA website, I can I can find the information and pass it on to Carter. Um, I think if you go under science and then science working groups, or it might be under committees, I can't remember. But on the SKA website, it should be relatively easy to find. And I believe that in the least, the chairs of the working groups are there. I don't know if everybody is listed. But the other thing you can find if you know where to look are mi minutes from all the the chair and the science working group meetings. So if you're interested in knowing what people have been talking about um, and the kinds of issues that they deal with, um, uh, you can find that all online and I can dig that up and pass it on to Carter. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. I, I was quickly looking but unable to find immediately the list of science groups. But if you want to mind sharing with us, I can pass that along to all the members later yeah, on. Yeah, for sure. Fantastic. Um, okay. I think that... Uh, I think that's all the questions everybody has. Um, I don't know if, I'll just give another second if anybody wants to raise their hand. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you very much, Dr. Speckens. This was a very informative talk. Uh, it seems to be a lot of room for astronomers to get involved, especially young astronomers. Um, and I, I think I speak for the group when I say the excitement level is very high for the uh, SKA.
Wonderful. And if, um, if you have any uh, comments or concerns or questions, um, please always please reach out. Um, I'm happy to to address them as I can. So thanks for thanks for listening and, uh, and please get in touch. Wonderful. Thank you.